So let's look at how to decode a convolutional code. And we're going to be using the famous Viterbi algorithm. I'm not going to give all the details here, but we're going to give the main points. And here we have our convolutional code, uh, where our data bits, uncoded, uh, are going to go into the shift register. And uh, in this case, I've drawn one with three elements. And then it creates, in this case, three parity bits, which are going to be sent. These are the coded bits. And the important thing is there's structure in these coded bits, which comes about because of the choice of these uh, functions here, which add up the elements of the shift register. And that structure, uh, which, is, which has memory because it's a shift register in a convolutional code, that structure is what we need to check at the receiver uh, so that we can find out if there are errors and correct those errors. So how do we do that process? How do we check and use that structure? Well, the first step is to set up a trellis. And the way to do that is to define all the elements of the uh, shift register except for the this one at the end, uh, and that defines the state. In this case, it's three elements in the shift register because it's a one-third rate. Well, well, there's three outputs here. It's a one-third rate convolutional code, and there's three elements in the shift register. So the state has two elements, and I've drawn out the possibilities here. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And this trellis, I'm going to fill it in, and we move from left to right as time increases. And I've just done an example here where we start at data bit 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Okay, so here I've drawn two branches in the trellis to get us started. So let's say we start here in state 00, zero at time 7. Uh, then what, where could we go? Well, we could only transition to two different states because we've got binary input. So if we have 00, zero in here, the next one that's going to move in as they shift along could be a 0 or it could be a 1. If it's a 0, then the next state as that moves along is still going to be 00. zero. That's this branch, because with this state here, it's still 0, 0. If there's a 1 in here and it shifts along, the next state is going to be 1, 0. And that's this state down here. This one here corresponds to 1, 0. So these are two branches that are possible if you are in the 0, 0 state. And then in green, I've shown what the output parity bits or the coded bits would be if you did that transition. So it, for this branch. So for example here, let's remind ourselves if you're in 0, 0 and there's a 0 there, then you've got all zeros in the, in the shift register. So you've got all zeros in your output coded bits. Uh, if you had a 1 here, then you had a 1, 0, 0, of course, because you're starting in 0, 0. And then the first output here would be 1, the second one would be 0, and the third one would be 1. So 1, 0, 1. Uh, and then we can see here, oh, well, these would be the sequences you would expect to receive at the receiver if there was no errors. If there are errors, you'll receive something else, and then you can check against here. And this is how do you do that checking. That's the important thing. So let's look at, uh, fill in this trellis in this between 7 and 8 with all the other possibilities. If you, if you started in this state, if you had a 0 and a 1, then there could either be a 0 or 1 that comes next. So you've still only got two states you can transition to. Uh, if it was a 0, if you're in the 0, 1 and there's a 0 coming in, then you're going to transition to the 0 state. If there's a 1, then you're going to transition to the 1, 0 state. Okay, and again, we can fill in the outputs that would be seen along there. If you did this transition here, where you're in 0, 1 and you're getting a 0 next, then you would have 0, 0, 1. So then this contributes to all the outputs. And so along this stream here, you would be seeing 1, 1, 1. This would be the coded bits that corresponds to this branch in the trellis. And for this branch in the trellis, uh, it would be 0, 1, 0. Okay, so if you were in 1, 0, then you could transition to either the 0, 1 state because um, if you have 1, 0 here, that 1 will move along and you'll either get a 0 coming in, which means 0, 1, or a 1 coming in, which means 1, 1. And the same thing for here, if you're in the 1, 1 state, you can go to those same two states. So these are all the possible transitions in the trellis. And I'm going to write in here all the possible outputs that you're going to see then uh, if you made those branches, 0, 0, 1 and 1, 0, 0. Okay, so how does the Viterbi algorithm work? Well, it, for, it, does, it knows that there's memory and structure in the coded bits, and so it knows that you can't just receive 
outputs at one time slot and then decide on the data bit in that time slot because there's memory in here, because it was a convolution as we saw. So the input data bits get spread out because of the convolution, get spread out over multiple time slots. So it's not possible or it's not optimal to just use one time slot of measurements to work out the data or decide on the data. You need to use multiple time slots of measurements. And this is where the Viterbi algorithm comes in. So at each, what it does is at each time slot, it goes to each of the different states and for each state, it tries to make a decision or it does make a decision about which of these two input paths it thinks was most likely. And the way it does that is it, it well, in, well, let's one step before then we say then it decides one of them and keeps it and discards the other. So let's just go back to the time slot one before and let's say, let's assume that it had done that and let's assume prior, so at, at seven it's done that already and it's decided that this one was the path that got us to that point. At the seventh data slot, this path was the one the Viterbi algorithm had decided, just for example. And let's say it decided that for the next uh, symbol at the same time slot, if it was, so what it's saying is if it was zero, zero at that time slot, then it thinks it got there along that path. What that means is it thinks the previous bit was a zero and so on back wherever that path came from. And then for this one, if if it was the case that at time seven, there was a zero one in here, then the Viterbi algorithm would th thinks that the best match for that would be a path that came in along this way. In other words, the previous bit prior to that was a one and then wherever that path goes prior to that. So in this example here, I'm just saying, let's say this one was chosen and let's say, for example, this one was chosen. And what the Viterbi algorithm does is each time it makes that decision, it's going to add the, a metric to the previous path metric. So this, each of these paths carries a thing called a path metric. So this is, for example, path metric at time seven for the first state. This has path metric at time seven for the second state. This has a path metric at time seven for the third state. And this has a path metric at time seven for the fourth state. And then it's going to go to here and it's going to decide. This is how the Viterbi algorithm works. It starts at each time slot, it goes here, and it looks at the measurements that it received, the three coded bits that it received at the receiver. Uh, some of them might be errors, of course, because of the error in the channel. And it's going to say, okay, it's going to match it up with that branch. And it's going to say, how likely was that branch? How close does that match up with the three bits that I measured? And you're going to add that to the path metric for the path that got it there in the first place. Then it's going to do this branch metric. It's going to say, how much did the three measurements I made for those three coded bits? How much do they match up with 111? And I'm going to add that to the path metric that got to that state. And so the path metric plus the branch metric, whichever of these two incoming possible paths has the lowest value, so they match up the best. Uh, so this path metric plus that branch metric, if that's lower than this path metric plus this branch metric, then you would pick this path, discard this one, uh, and then you do the same process for the others. You're not picking between the states, so you're, you're not actually at this time, you're not actually saying that one of these is the one that you think. It's just that if it was this state, so if it was zero, zero, then it was this path. Now, for, if I go back here, if it was 0, 0, then it's this path. If it was 0, 1, it thinks it's that path, and so on. And so let's say, for example, that it had chosen uh, this path here. So let's say it chose that path. It measured the three, the three coded bits that were measured at the receiver in this time slot 8, and it measured up that it matched up with that branch metric, and the path that it got there was fairly small. Okay, let's say down here, for example, let's say that this path was chosen, just as an example. Okay, and I'm, the other ones would have something chosen, but I'm just not going to draw them just for now. I just want to make a point about uh, why the, uh, how the, the um, memory is being used. So let's say at this time slot, uh, this one was chosen. So each time, each time slot for each state, it's going to choose one of the incoming paths. Okay, so let's say for this state it chose that one and say, let's say at this state now, it has a choice between this one and this one. Okay, so this is the choice. That, let's say I'll put those dotted lines. Let's, let's look at what's going to happen here. So let's say the green ones had been chosen 
for this state, it had chosen this path metric and branch metric. And for this state at time nine, it had chosen this path metric and branch metric. Okay, so what, what are the output along here? Well, that's of course what we would expect, zero, zero, zero. That's what that one corresponds to. Uh, let's just write down this one. This one's the one, zero, one. What's this one? This one is this one here. It's the one, one, zero. So whenever you're making this transition from this state to that state, you're going to expect to see 110. That's the coded bits. So you'd expect to see them at the receiver. And this one along here is the 111. 111. Okay, so let's say we've made these. There's other path choices have been made for the other ones, but I'm just not showing them. So let's just look at this task here. So now I can see if this happened to have been chosen, so I'm just looking at this example for now, the Viterbi algorithm has to, what does it, what does it do? Well, as we said before, it goes to the state and then it decides which path was the most likely to have come to it. So it's, you know, under the assumption that it's got 0, 0 in here, as under the assumption that it's 0, 0 for this example, which one was most likely to have come to it? Was it that it came from the 0, 0 state or was it that it came from this 0, 1 state? That's the choice it's got to make. Well, it's going to add that branch metric to the path metric that got up to there. Um, so let's see again here. So uh, uh, let me write this one here. This is the path metric for 8, 1, and then it's going to add to the path metric for 9, 1. And this is going to be here, the path metric here for 8, 3. And this is the path metric for 9, 2. Okay, so this choice, to repeat it again, is the branch metric plus that path metric that got there. So here would be the path metric 9, 1 plus the branch metric here, which says the three bits that I'm measuring at this time, how much do they match up with 0, 0, 0? And then he's going to compare that number. So that branch metric plus the path metric is going to compare that to this branch metric, which says how much do the three bits match up to 1, 1, 1 plus the path metric PM 9, 2. Well, let's look back and make an observation. Whichever decision that it makes here, for this example, when you look back, they all go, both of these paths go through this state. So no matter what the decision is that this that is made here, either way, the decision would be that from there backwards, it was this path. Okay? So all no matter what the decision is here, it's already made, effectively, it's already made its decisions from that time backwards because that path is the only path that gets to this point here. It either gets there by going this way or it gets there by going this way. Regardless, from time less than seven, it's always going to be picking the same data bits. So it'll make the same digital decisions about what the input data bits were because these states represent the input data bits. So it's making a decision now, but from seven for, for this state for seven previously it's always for all time slots before seven in this example no matter what the decision is up here they're going to correspond to the same data sequence before time equals seven okay and let's look at what contributes to this decision so because that path metric is the same here it's going to be adding to this branch metric this branch metric and this branch metric and the only difference is this branch metric this one and this one so the only difference between these two path metrics here, because they start at the same state and therefore they have the same path metric, the only difference between these two path metrics is that this one came from those two branch metrics and this one came from those two. Prior to that, they, they have the same value because they're adding their branch metrics as they go. So here, it's actually a case, you can hopefully you can see now, to make a decision here, it's really a decision between whether it was 0, 0, 0, followed by 0, 0, 0, followed by 0, 0, 0, was that the sequence that was received over the previous three time slots, or was this the sequence that was received? 0, 1, uh, sorry, 1, 0, 1, uh, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. So this decision here is really, hopefully you can see that here, in this example, it's a, it comes down to, it's not just a case of taking a measurement at time slot 10 and deciding 
whether you think the data bit in the 10th time slot was a one or a zero. It's actually taking a comparison of those three sequences, so the, all of this sequence here, compared with those ones here. And so you're going to be taking all the nine measurements, effectively when you make that decision, you're effectively saying those nine measurements, the nine measurements over these three time slots, do they match up better with this sequence or this sequence? And these are much longer sequences, so any errors that happen in here, it's very unlikely. Like if, you only, if, the, if this only made one error in this sequence, then it's unlikely that you would think it was the other sequence. Let's say this sequence was actually sent. What's the chances that you would confuse it with this sequence? Well, if it was only one bit that was sent, and you receive a one, and you think, it, and and but it really should have been a zero, then you can't tell. That's the case for uncoded bits, where you've only got one bit at a time. But here, where you've got the memory, you're looking at sequences now that you're choosing between in the algorithm, and so now you've got nine bits, and so if one of them's in error it'll still match up best with the sequence that, uh, that, it was, that it came from. If two bits came in error, it still matches up best with the sequence. Three bits, you can handle lots of bits of error, and you're still going to be matching it up with the sequence that it came from. You've got to make lots of errors before it starts looking like the other sequence, and then, then you'd be making the wrong choice here. But you only make the wrong choice if, if there's lots of errors in this sequence. And that's the advantage of this convolutional code, where it spreads the data out in time over multiple time slots. Of course, I'm showing one example here where it only goes back over three. There's other examples, of course. Let's say that hadn't been chosen there, and let's say this came from this path and here. Well, they don't match up for further back. These sequences would be even longer. So there would be even less chance that you're going to make an error in your decision in the Viterbi algorithm. Finally, when you get to the finally to the end, the Viterbi algorithm does have to make an actual choice between which of these states, because at the moment it's keeping its options open. Like if we look at this time slot of seven, it's got four surviving paths because there are four states. Uh, notice that nothing, in this example, nothing came from that state onwards. So the Viterbi algorithm really has made a choice and has decided that it's not zero and one in the data was not zero and one at time six because that path, that state didn't have a path that survived. But it doesn't make hard decisions fully until it gets right to the end. And in fact, what generally happens is you end your data sequence with all zeros and you know that that's going to be the case. So you will end up at this, this state up here at the end. There will only be that one that survives and then you just look back along the path that survived until that point. The important thing I wanted to, to get across, though, is that the memory in the convolutional code is used in the Viterbi algorithm, and effectively you are now in the Viterbi algorithm by looking backwards and making choices in this way, you're actually ending up comparing sequences with sequences rather than simply just bits with bits. And that's the way that you are using the structure in the code in the decoder so that your, the structure is contained in these long sequences that you're comparing between. And the fact that they're long sequences means there's more bits different between them, which means you'd have to make more errors to actually confuse one with the other. And that's why it's, got, it's, it's, it's uh, most likely that you'll make the right decision, even if lots of errors happen. So don't forget, uh, if this video was helpful, to like the video. It helps others to find it. And uh, subscribe to the channel for more videos. And check the links below for related videos.